Good morning, everyone. Welcome to SREcon. I'm Laura McGuire, the lead researcher at Jelly. And when I got started as a researcher looking into the world of digital service delivery of site reliability engineering, I used to tell my friends and my family that I was studying the work of people who kept society from collapsing. And they kind of look at me and be like, who is it? Are you studying politicians, police, social workers, bartenders? And with all the considerable confidence of a first year PhD student, I'd shake my head slowly and I'd say, nah, software engineers. And you could see their brains kind of short circuiting, trying to draw this relationship between complete societal annihilation and the archetype of a software engineer with their hoodies and their sneakers and their Dr. Peppers. And so I'd walk them through how over the last 10 years, the world has been fundamentally changing in ways that the average person had really little to no idea of. And I'd say things like, you know how we need services like 911 call routing services to never fail? And you know how you'd like your electronic health records to be always available to your doctor? You know how you never, ever, like ever want Netflix to go down? Well, keeping these systems not only well maintained, but also continually getting better and faster, it takes considerable effort. And so these are the people that I'm studying. This is the work that I'm studying. And in doing so, what I'm doing is I'm increasing our understanding of how, despite rampant complexity, continual change, massive scales and speeds, despite all of this, this is how they keep these systems up and running and driving many of the core functions within society. I study how they strive for near perfect reliability as they build and grow and maintain the systems that we rely on for everything from entertainment to financial markets, to telecommunications, to transportation, to governance. And I think that like most people would kind of grok it they'd be, okay, cool, that sounds interesting. And then inevitably they'd change the subject till the pandemic happened. And then all of a sudden it became immediately, personally relevant. And they realized the critical dependencies that they had on their technology for work, for relaxation, for connection. And at the start of the pandemic, out of nowhere, I got emails from these friends and family being like, so is <laughs> your research finished? How's those uh, software engineers? Are we good? And I actually don't entirely know how to answer that because I'm not sure if we are good because we've placed a lot on the shoulders of SREs. The demands of rapidly scaling 24 seven reliability of critical digital infrastructure, it's not inconsequential. And as we increasingly move operations to the cloud and towards continuous deployment, everything, we stretch the capabilities of the technology, much of it, which is still emerging and changing itself. And we exponentially stretch the knowledge and the competency requirements for those who build and grow and maintain the technology. When the speed of digital transformation already makes highly skilled workers a scarcity. And importantly, we stretch the capacities of those who are tasked with keeping these systems upright because the demands of a life on call and of living up to four, four nines reliability metrics are very taxing on the people that we can't afford to burn out as we make this transformation. But if there's one thing that I do know, it's the, the way that we're currently thinking about SRE work and organizing SRE work and coordinating across these tangled layered networks of highly interdependent systems is insufficient. 
And we are in a lot of trouble if we continue to oversimplify the sophisticated, the nuanced, and the highly technical nature of the work that you do. But the future is not all bleak. Because what I saw and what I heard in the three years that I spent looking over engineer shoulders and listening in on 3 a.m. conference calls and of talking with SREs about the stresses and the aspirations of this kind of work was that there is a sort of profound resilience and adaptive capacity in many of you. And this is often in spite of counterproductive organizational demands and practices and technologies that sort of, kind of, but not quite help you out during really high pressured incident response. And this is often a, a very collective resilience as you're working with people that you know, and often many that you don't. And it really shows up in the ways that you're able to detect, to diagnose, to repair and restore your systems, despite conditions of uncertainty and of ambiguity, and importantly, of time pressure. But it's often hidden. It's hidden amongst the deploys and the pages and the backups and the migrations and the failovers. It's a kind of secret life, these unrevealed complexities and nuances of what it really means to do site reliability engineering. These are hidden in the written formal representations that don't actually account for the full extent of the cognitive work involved in being an SRE. And Today, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus directly on these things to shine a light on these subtle and often hidden efforts that go unnoticed. Because a socio-technical systems analysis looks at the real world of work, the good, the bad, the, well, not so pretty. Because in doing so, it means that we can fundamentally shift how we level up new engineers, how we develop new work practices, how we design the tooling, how we learn from our incidents. Also that we can support our engineers to more quickly understand the nature of the problems that they face, its implications for their actions or their inactions, and to be able to draw in and organize the right people so that ultimately they can resolve incidents faster. But how do we get there? Well, we often start by understanding the world as it is today. And the lens that I'll use is one of cognitive systems engineering. Because for the last 30 years, we've looked at the work of experts like astronauts and surgeons and fighter pilots. And we use a variety of methods that can help surface insights about the cognitive work that's inherent in highly technical complex adaptive environments where hazards arise from multiple compounding and interactive variables and where risk is largely emergent. And if this doesn't already sound like the world that you live in, what SREs also share in common with them is that successful performance actually requires finely tuned adaptive capacity to very rapidly and precisely adjust to uncertain and changing conditions. And where despite the best planning and the best deployment processes, highly automated IT systems running at speed and scale can generate these partially or completely unstructured problems that force you to bring your knowledge to bear in new and different ways. And so this is really where my interest as a researcher comes from, because while of course there's obvious differences between space exploration and software engineering, there's many similarities that can be abstracted out of the specific details of the type of work that you're doing to focus on what's really central here. How do we define expert performance in these complex, adaptive, and uncertain environments? And so, as your tour guide into the secret lives of SREs, I'm leaning not only on the knowledge that I gained in my master's degree in human factors and system safety, and in my dissertation research where I looked in depth at 62 cases of difficult incident response, 
but also on my own experiences as a frontline practitioner. And it's precisely this experience of working in forestry operations that actually grounds me in both my academic research and in the work that I do as the lead researcher at Jelly. It's that I've spent a good chunk of my career on the sharp end, on the front lines of having to make decisions and take actions under uncertainty. And what it's taught me is that there's always more to the story than initially appears when something goes wrong. There's more nuance, there's more history involved, there's more hidden interdependencies that constrain available actions, and there's more complexity in the decisions that are faced and more uncertainty about what's actually going on when you're in the middle of an unexpected incident. And so there's a few key ideas that have guided me as I looked into this world of critical digital service delivery. The first idea is grounded in the need to coordinate multiple diverse perspectives in real time. Because in complex adaptive systems where things are always changing, you need overlapping sets of knowledge and experience to handle a wider range of problems. Because the cognitive demands of troubleshooting a live system under time pressure are really substantial. And so you have to draw from across a set of capabilities to both meet the demands of the issue, but also to limit the duration of the, the outage. In this way, it gives rise to a bit of a coordination paradox. Well, if we know everyone's mental model is gonna be partial and incomplete, and we need these multiple diverse perspectives to bring to, together to handle these difficult cases, but there's also cognitive load that's involved in trying to organize and coordinate all these multiple perspectives, there's a really interesting tension there. And that's the tension that I looked at. How is it that responders manage this substantial technical work of detecting, diagnosing, and repairing faults in live production environments with the additional demands that are brought about by needing to also manage the coordination of these multiple perspectives in real time? And this coordinated effort comes with additional cognitive costs. There's always cognitive load that's inherent in communicating and coordinating work across multiple groups. And as we'll talk about, the more diverse those groups and the less they've worked together, the less common ground they have to be able to keep those costs low during an escalating event. And it's worth actually noting that these things matter even more today than they have at any other point in the past. Because previously, most forms of critical incident response were held in control rooms, like this one, where we can see the NASA engineers during the Apollo 13 event. And in these kinds of contexts, these co-located contexts, a well-designed control room has substantial benefits over the distributed context that we're in today. It takes substantially more cognitive effort to coordinate in a remote setting than when you're all in the same room, largely because when you're in the same room, you get a lot of information, implicit information about the state of the event, about your fellow responders and their, the, their ability to coordinate and to help with your problems when you're in this, when you're in a shared space. So, this is this problem space that you're working in, this complex adaptive environment where you need multiple perspectives. Those multiple perspectives have costs of drawing together and being in a remote distributed environment adds an additional layer of complexity. So this is the reason why understanding the hidden work is so important. Because if we get a better understanding of it, we can design better tools, better practices, we can improve the training that can reduce the demands on engineers in already demanding work. And so to bring some of the findings from my research to life, I wanna introduce you to three engineers that I met in my research, because I think that their stories help illustrate the key points that, what I wanna, that I wanna make about the work that's often hidden in SRE life. And so they personify these patterns that emerged over and over and over again in the cases that I studied, 
And who knows, maybe you'll see a part of yourself in them as well. So to talk a little bit about the complexity in SRE work and to shine some light on the realities of socio-technical systems, I'm gonna introduce you to Sean. And so Sean was the product lead for a really popular project management and ticketing tool on an internal tools team. This was a large company that provided business to business IT infrastructure to a global market. And Sean's team helped support modern software development methods by resourcing the company's devs teams with tooling. So they were a new team running lean while they resourced up. And because they'd recently taken over as service owners, and because it was Sean's first time as a product lead, it was decided that they would manage the tool in a semi-customized SaaS offering with the infrastructure being hosted on the company's internal cloud services. Um, and so this distributed the management of the service between the virtual machine provider, the internal cloud services, the tool vendor, and Sean's team itself. And so, uh, in this case, over the past couple of weeks, the tool had been experiencing some performance degradations and users were getting pretty angry. So Sean and his team had actually planned a six hour system maintenance window. They were gonna upgrade memory and CPU and then just reboot the hosting infrastructure and improve the user experience. And so the Friday evening maintenance began as planned and Sean started taking a backup and a snapshot but his attempts to take a backup failed. He actually noticed while he was investigating that the previous upgrade had included a new version of the backup utilities, but there were no indications of this in the release notes from the vendor. And as he started investigating further, he found that the backup system had been reporting false positives, and in fact, no backups had been occurring. The last good backup had been done 23 days prior. However, since the backup process was configured to only save five days of backups when the job runs successfully, there were actually no good backups available on the backup server. In fact, the last good backup that he found was from six weeks prior because this one had been used to test the restore process and it had actually been saved to a different directory. So, Sean's in a tough spot here because he knows that users are going to be really difficult to deal with if they had to endure another week of performance issues. But at the same time, the time pressure is mounting because the cloud services team is scheduled to start the upgrade. And Sean wasn't going to have time to install the new version of backup utilities before the planned maintenance began. So he calls another engineer on the team and you know, talks it over and they decide that taking a full disk snapshot of the VM would provide suitable safety for the maintenance to proceed. And then they could resolve the backups issues on the following day. So he does that, takes the snapshot, cloud services team conducts the maintenance. And after the maintenance, Sean installs the new version of the backup utilities and they run as normal. This backup reports success. But as Sean would find out later, this would also turn out to be a false positive. So while these backups were running, he also noticed that the hypervisor storage was showing at 95%. So he deleted some log files to create a bit more space until more storage could be added. Sean finished up his work. He was ready to go home. But shortly afterwards, monitoring started alerting that the system was down and users were experiencing 503 errors because the hypervisor storage had been exceeded. So Sean was a bit perplexed here. He attempted to free up some space by deleting some logs and turning off the VMs. But because it was the weekend, he didn't have very many support personnel available for a consultation. So he opens up a high severity ticket with the internal cloud services teams, requesting that additional space be added so that when the teams come back online for Monday, he's going to be able to prevent some additional issues. But he also needs help now. And so efforts to engage the cloud computing and the virtualization support were actually delayed because his team didn't have the appropriate level of support contract for off hours support. So Sean's now feeling really uncomfortable with the amount of issues that are starting to stack up. 
And he's also super frustrated that he can't get help. So he calls his manager at home who begins negotiating for c concurrent support while the service agreement is being established. And so finally the VM provider agrees to help and their technician starts trying to diagnose the problem. But the log files that had been deleted to save space actually made it difficult to determine where the problem was. So at this point, we're really only an hour into when the issues were first reported. And already the complexities and the difficulties that have arisen are pretty substantial. So this is a fascinating case that we could analyze for several hours. But even in looking at the first hour of the incident, it clearly shows that there's a lot of hidden complexity that Sean, and likely you, have to deal with in incident response. As new service owners, the team was still learning about their dependencies, the complexities that were inherent in past decisions about how to host the service. They were learning about their constraints to actually manage outages and what kinds of coordination was needed to bring the right people to the problem at the right point in time. So there's this confluence of factors, technical failures with the backups, the vendor failing to report the full extent of the changes in the backup utility, time pressure to meet this maintenance window, siloing that actually set up the cloud provider as a really inflexible component, and these trade-off decisions that had been made at some point in the past about support agreements. All of these factors compounded the problems that were experienced in this incident. In fact, this case is a textbook example of what's known in cognitive systems engineering as an escalation. As problems cascade, they produce this escalation of cognitive and coordinative demands. And as new problems are encountered or actions start to bring about unexpected results, there's this expansion of uncertainty around what's happening, why it's happening, what's going to happen next. These all produce substantial co uh, cognitive demands. And as the problems grow or the event drags on, more and more roles get involved, which actually drives the demands for communication and coordination. And so, as you might notice in this event, these escalating demands are actually hard to see and how they get handled is hidden in this secret life of being an SRE. And it's a core reason why incident analysis and any retrospective judgments about how well an incident has been handled needs to account for the cognitive and coordinative demands because these increase or decrease depending on the kinds of problems that are faced. And in fact, it's actually one of the limitations of using a metric like mean time to resolve as a basis for assessing performance in incident response, because it just doesn't account for the difficulties of the case that you might actually be comparing apples to oranges in these kinds of measurements. So this kind of brings up an interesting point. By now you might kind of be saying, hold on, hold on. This, this sounds totally like an outlier event. There's too many multiple compounding aspects. It sounds too radical. The team sounds too unprepared. Our organization would like never have these kinds of incidents. But I'll tell you that in the 62 incidents that I looked at, each had escalating demands and complexity and social and organizational factors that represented additional demands for the incident responders. Each incident was full of seemingly trivial incidents or issues that independently wouldn't amount to much, but jointly they create this very novel and cascading series of issues, some of which are latent in the system, but they have to be dealt with. And the extent of these contributing factors made it really challenging to know whose skills, knowledge, access to the system, and expertise was actually needed. In what kinds of combinations, given that the actual availabilities of people are always shifting, 
in this case, because the formal support relationships that may or may not have been established, and also because of the timing of the event. And at what point in time is it relevant and useful to bring them in as the incident unfolds? So understanding these dynamics can help to inform how you design and resource cross-functional interactions. Whether you need accessibility to needed data or expertise, and what vulnerabilities exist when these needed support structures are not actually in place. And next, I want to actually introduce you to Sarah, because the problems that surfaced with Sean's team were not isolated. Again and again, in incident after incident I studied, I saw a lot of these same difficulties, and I saw how poorly designed coordination added cognitive uh, demands to the SREs. But I also saw examples of this where, you know, teams were able to overcome these additional burdens and they were still able to smoothly resolve the incident. And I actually first noticed how this was happening with Sarah. She was a senior staff engineer at a very uh, high performing team. And once I saw this pattern in how it was that she coped with poor coordination design, I began actually seeing it to a greater and lesser extent across multiple teams. And so I began cataloging what are her sources of knowledge that helps make her in indispensable. I mean, it's obvious she had like deep technical knowledge of her service and of the systems that she managed. She was often brought into these really tough, challenging incidents, and she quickly had an understanding of the potential problems even in incidents that had been going on for several hours. And I realized that part of what set Sarah apart was how she looked at the problem. She knew who to get involved when the incident got real spicy. She knew what information others would need before they got involved in the problem. And she provided that. She knew she'd need to bring in experts from across dependent services to provide more context about how a proposed solution might actually impact others. So she had this really deep technical knowledge of the system. And it wasn't just about how the components sort of fit together. She knew what normal system behavior was, she knew what abnormal or anomalous system behavior was and what the implications for, for their service was. She knew where the technical debt was, legacy code or otherwise like less stable parts of the architecture were likely to cause problems for them. She could recall previous non-routine or exceptional events and the responses that they'd actually taken. And she used this basis of knowledge to be able to reason about problems, about potential mitigations, about the impact to users, about potential goal conflicts or trade-off decisions, and also how to sequence how service restoration should go. And while she'd often ve like va verify or validate her initial thoughts by, say, looking at dashboards or prior incident reports, she actually held a lot of context in her head, which made her really efficient and effective at being able to connect the dots in an incident. And a second base of knowledge that I started seeing in her was it had to do with her knowledge of other responders that she worked with. She knew what they knew about the system. She knew who amongst her teammates could carry out certain actions, she understood the pressures and the constraints that her team was under and how the collective group responded to those pressures and constraints. She knew what was the usual course of action and how would they handle exceptions. She understood roles and functions and how those interact in practice. She understood the limits and the boundary of individuals' authorities and of the responsibilities. And this really translated into knowing when the team could handle an outage and when to get others involved, either because they needed their access, their authority, or their specific vantage point on the problem to be able to expand her own team's capabilities to handle the disruption. 
For example, she knew stuff like if an incident ran late, her colleague Alex would have to leave because he'd have to go pick up his daughter because his husband worked out of town. So she could proactively think about the things that she needed him to do before he left and who else she could recruit into the event so that she could maintain the team's momentum to handle the disruption. So, you know, it's interesting because the software industry like distinguishes between the social and the technical aspects of the system, but they're actually inextricably linked. An individual's ability to bring their technical knowledge to bear in context is critically dependent on the context in which that takes place. And this got me really interested in what engineers needed to know about the organization as a whole that aided them in helping make, like helping make them the rock stars that like everybody wanted in their incidents. And as I looked at what Sarah and others knew about the organization, it was that they had this really keen sense about organizational demands, like shifting priorities, like what were the Z orientation of the new management that was coming in and what kinds of disruptions that might bring about, the shifting dynamics of how production pressure or code freezes in one part of the company might impact other parts, including her own. And she and others knew that goal conflicts are an inherent part of the work that they were doing. And they knew how they were typically handled and how decisions got made. They were pretty astute about who had formal and informal decision-making authority and how quickly or slowly those decisions got made. They learned a lot about the boundaries for organizational silos and the implications of those silos for how they got their work done. They also knew a lot about historical events that had actually influenced the way that coordination and work takes place in their organization. And the more I dug in, I also realized there was a fourth element that was related but distinct about this foundational knowledge. And it's this more broad understanding of others, including stakeholders, users, managers, vendors, regulators. And they applied this knowledge about the others that they had to work with to be able to anticipate problems, to see opportunities, to engage others, and to proactively reach out and coordinate with someone to minimize the blast radius of the events that they faced. And collectively, the more that this knowledge was shared across team members or across an ad hoc team, it actually provided this solid common ground that responders used individually to be better SREs, but also collectively to lower the amount of extraneous communication and the effort that goes into working jointly. But as you can imagine with this basis for common ground, there's a substantial investment that has to be made to both establish it and continually update it. And in the Sarah's in an organization, they're not just good at what they do because of their system knowledge. They're good because they see this bigger picture and they can understand what the, op the options for action actually are. So this makes coping with moving, with fast moving, with complex, with cascading problems much easier to handle. And the exciting thing that, uh, about the research that I conducted was that this, this, this basis for common ground, it's only one of 14 coordinative elements and functions that I was able to identify that aids in efficient incident response. And so while I'd love to cover more of them, there is actually a final point that I want to make because it's critical to in how we think about organizing for incident response. And so Jesse and his team are indicative of this pattern that emerged from the high performing teams that I studied. And so Jesse's company ascribed to this pretty typical and generally accepted understanding of how incidents progress. And at a very high level, you could certainly say that, yeah, incident response handles, you know, handling follows a pretty linear progression. 
you see it, you figure it out, you repair it, you fix it, you move on. And for straightforward or known issues like those that you might see in a really stable or mature system that has very few code changes, this flow might actually work reasonably well. But what I saw in the cases that I studied, these difficult problems, was that for systems that are operating at speed and at scale, this is actually an oversimplification because incident response is rarely, if ever, a linear sequential process with discrete phases. Instead, there's actually a lot of uncertainty in incidents. You might need to, uh, to take action to safeguard a system before you even really know what's going on. A huge aspect of the response is figuring out who can help you and then recruiting and bringing them up to speed. It's also not always clear why something worked. You might end up getting interrupted in your response to respond to that VP who sends an email to ask what is going on. And there's always this sort of residual uncertainty that can create additional demands. And importantly, knowing the impacts of past incidents on future actions is actually crucial for keeping this very current mental model about what are the explodey bits in your system. And so it's this interplay between the cognitive work of an incident progression and the need to coordinate that actually began to reveal some very problematic elements with how incident response teams are typically structured to handle these overlapping and concurrent demands. And typically, organizations will use a model that's based on the incident command system to tame the often overwhelming and sometimes frantic demands of these high pressure, high tempo events. And of course, central to this idea is the incident commander who wades into this chaotic mess to try and stem the issues and create order, commanding the incident into submission. And according to the Google SRE chapter on incident command, they hold this high level state about the incident. They structure the response, they assign the responsibilities, and they hold all the other positions that haven't been delegated. But Here's the thing, though, in a highly complex and fast moving incident, this is exceptionally cognitively demanding work. And it also requires a very broad basis of common ground to be able to handle successfully. One that's not often often found in just a single responder. So inevitably, the incident commander's ability to keep track of the changing conditions, to coordinate the multiple streams of activity that are underway, and to execute that coordination in real time, it falls apart. The demands of the event overwhelm their ability to stay in front of the pace of the work. And so what you see when this happens is that the IC will slow things down or sometimes stop them entirely to allow the group to, to come back together and get on the same page. And so on the surface, this seems kind of logical. Well, if escalating demands overcome your capacity of any one person to manage them in real time, you need to artificially slow it down. But to users, that slowdown adds to the frustration or worse. And in effect, your team could be moving faster, but designing coordination in this way actually sets up a workload bottleneck where the information processing capabilities of a single participant define the collective speed of the response. That doesn't make any sense. Why would you intentionally put a speed bump into your incident response practices? We design incident response schedules across geographic time zones to make sure that there is no delay in dealing with problems for global users. And on a microcognitive level, slowing down the potential pace of the response to the speed of the incident commander is like having Europe wait until North America wakes up to manage the incident response. So I began to wonder, what would it look like if we distributed the coordination and incident response the way we do distributed computing, 
where even though the components are spread out across multiple computers, they run as one system. What if the elements of coordination were spread out across multiple responders, yet they still run as one system? And about the same time that I started thinking about this, I started studying the incidents that Jesse managed. And Jesse's team was structured in a very typical incident command fashion, where as the incident commander, Jesse owned all these coordinated functions. But instead of seeing the expected workload bottlenecks and the slowed down response efforts, him and his team actually worked quite well. They actually worked, when I looked closer, something more like this, where the coordinative elements, such as the need to gather information, to synthesize its meaning, and then communicate that out to maintain common ground, was a shared responsibility. The recruitment of needed expertise and then bringing them up to speed with information relevant to make them useful was a shared responsibility. The sequencing and synchronizing of activity was a shared responsibility. So there was still the role of an incident commander because there's certainly times where decisions have to be made and you, know, you wanna make sure that someone is looking at the bigger picture, but these roles play a very different function in supporting the adaptive choreography of real-time incident response. Because what I found in these high performing teams was that in multi party high pressure events, very rapid and direct interactions among the responders typically worked quite well. So, does this seem a little too wild for your incidents? I'd actually suggest that you're probably doing this to a greater or lesser extent. If you think about the last incident that you were in, you get kind of paged into the event and it's not your first rodeo. So you join Slack and right away you type, I'm checking the logs. In this one little sentence, you've already disrupted the incident command model. You've taken initiative, you haven't been delegated to. And you do this based on your knowledge of the system, the most recent code deploys, any events or expected loads on the system that you're aware of. You do this because you're usually the first one to respond to a page and you know that others are going to be piling in behind you shortly and you want them to do something useful. So you state out your actions out loud. It's an example of providing observability into your actions so others know what activities are underway and what other kinds of activities are likely to be useful. If you say, I'm going to kill the jobs, You've also provided insight into your orientation towards the problem and towards potential mitigating actions. Without fully explaining it, you've provided a basis for understanding what you think might be going on and what actions are likely to either produce more diagnostic information, what might eliminate noise in the system, or what might prevent a cascade of, of effects from muddying the waters. So expert practitioners speak in a highly encoded language, and these small utterances often mean very little to outsiders, but to an insider, to a fellow responder, it reveals a lot. Now, for this implicit coordination to work, you've got to have a basis for common ground, like Sarah showed. Because if your statement violates others' expectancies, it offers an opportunity for them to question your thinking further. So either you can be recalibrated or they can. You move towards and away this shared from this shared understanding and monitoring whether you're all on the same page or not. And this function can't and shouldn't only be left to the incident commander. Continuously maintaining common ground enables the full complement of responders to be able to aid in decision making, to identify potential courses for action, and ultimately to keep the speed up. So as I went back over the other cases that I'd reviewed, I noticed a pattern that none of the teams actually followed the incident command structure entirely. On paper, their processes were all in alignment. And if you asked them, they'd say they did incident command. 
But upon closer analysis, it was clear that the functional requirements of coordination were distributed across the team. And they carried out coordinated functions as they carried out their techni technical tasks. And so this maintaining a low level but continuous awareness about the state of the event, they're able to provide continual input into critical decisions and point out potential threats or implications for different courses of action. And the more common ground that that team had, the smoother the adaptive choreography of the event. They're able to anticipate what needed to be done next and then take the initiative to do it. And as they listened in on what others were doing, they were better able to sequence the timing of their own actions. The responders in these groups actually recognized more readily when someone had an incomplete understanding of the problem or when they were acting on erroneous beliefs. And they're able to quickly, with quick exchanges, help everyone update their mental model and to repair that common ground. In other words, because everyone has kept this low level awareness about the event progression, they're able to share the responsibilities of coordination and support the incident commander to better coordinate the event, not command it. So these lessons that I learned from Sean and from Sarah and from Jesse and the countless other engineering teams that shared their incident data helped me validate these patterns across a broad range of circumstances. And this represents a really exciting new way to reconsider how we think about and organize SRE work in these modern complex adaptive systems. And so I've covered a lot of ground. I wanted to shine a light on these secret lives of SREs. And my hope is that in revealing the complexity of socio socio-technical systems and these cognitive and coordinative demands, that we're providing some promising directions for how we can better support efforts in critical incident response, and that you'll take what you've heard. You'll dig deeper into your own incidents to learn more that can help yourself and your team with establishing and maintaining common ground, and that you'll consider the ways in which your existing practices could be more finely tuned to better support the challenges inherent in difficult outages. And while myself and my colleagues can play a role in kind of surfacing these deeper insights, it's ultimately up to the software industry to support engineers and the critical functions that they're going to manage on behalf of society. So in that way, the question that I was, that I was asked isn't really one that I should answer. Instead, it's up to you all. So what do you think? Are we good? Thank you very much. <laughs>